Hello and welcome to this lecture on measurement and employee selection. That which cannot be measured cannot be studied scientifically. So measurement is the essence of good science. The scientific application of selection procedures is therefore built firmly on a measurement base. Let's get started. What is measurement? Well, that sounds like a simple question. Sometimes the answer is simple and sometimes it's not. Measurement is the systematic application of pre-established rules or standards for assigning numbers or scores to the attributes or traits of an individual. These rules provide bases for clearly and consistently assigning numbers to objects. You must be consistent with the application of numbers to things. A score of, say, 8 must mean the same thing to different people, and different people should all agree that the score should be 8. The attributes or traits of an individual are the external and internal qualities and abilities of individuals assessed or inferred through direct or indirect observation. The numbers provide a convenient means for characterizing and differentiating among people, who in this case are job applicants. Remember this. People are different, sometimes very different, and sometimes not very different. In the case of the former, the number assigned to their traits should be very different. In the case of the latter, the number assigned to their traits should be different enough so as to matter, but not so different as to imply great large differences. The goal of measurement is to identify those who should be hired. It's pretty simple, huh? Actually, it's not. But our goal in this lecture is to make it understandable and useful for your lives as HR selection experts. Let's move on. Okay, now we're going to look at different types of variables using the nomenclature of statistics. First, we have the criterion, which is also known as the outcome or dependent variable. For HR selection, the ultimate criterion is employee success. Defining success is not as easy as you might surmise. So here are some examples. They could include absenteeism, turnover, citizenship behaviors, error rates, goods produced, total sales, scrap rates, speed of performance, and the list goes on and on and on. All of these are aspects of job performance. So there is a strong positive correlation between employee success and job performance. How you measure job performance or employee success differs greatly depending upon the job and the company. There are some best practices which are important to keep in mind, but we don't cover such techniques until the end of this video lecture. Here are some rules or as a sort of a heads up. Employee success must be recognizable. You should know it when you see it. Employee success must be important to the job. Measuring things that don't matter is an exercise in futility. Such things tend to contaminate the measurement of success or performance. For example, one would never measure customer complaints for a retail company's accountants. That's just not what accountants do or should be responsible for. Employee success absolutely must be appropriately assessed. This is the essence of measurement, and there is an entire field of study devoted to measurement, such as psychometrics or even econometrics. Most HR selection folks have very little exposure to either, but they should. Let's move on. Next, we turn to another type of variable, the predictor variable. It's also known as an antecedent or an independent variable. A predictor variable is responsible for change in a criterion variable. A predictor causes a criterion. In most cases, it is a measure of an employee attribute that is defined through job analysis as being important for job success. In HR selection, the typical predictors include things like test interviews, biographical data questionnaires, application blanks, and assessment center exercises. Actually, each of those things is a test. 
There are tests on which one scores a particular score, and that score is used to predict employee success or job performance. Now, as we know from Griggs v. Duke Power, every test, that is every predictor, must be relevant to the job. If a high school diploma has no relationship with one's ability to do the job, then having a high school diploma cannot be used to predict job performance and cannot be used as a test upon which one makes hiring or promotion decisions. Additionally, there must exist an appropriate way to measure employee attributes identified as critical to job success. You cannot just make up tests on the fly. Tests must be validated, examined, used on holdout samples, and revalidated constantly. Let's move on. Here we turn to various scales upon which attributes are measured. A scale must have precision of measurement. That is, a scale must be precise in what it measures. For example, people are not classified as either short or tall. That's very imprecise. In the U.S., we measure height in feet and inches, like six feet, four inches. In other parts of the world, the measurement is even more precise and uses meters and centimeters, like 1.93 meters or 193 centimeters. Nowhere is measurement of human height done as either short or tall. It doesn't allow us to truly and accurately differentiate between slightly different heights. Precision should allow for a multitude of distinct scores like 193 centimeters or 190 centimeters or 164 centimeters. Precision allows one to determine the meaningfulness of the numbers or scores. Tall or short is not meaningful. Six feet four inches is meaningful. The actual scale of measurement is a means by which individuals can dis be distinguished from one another on a variable of interest, whether that variable is a predictor or a criterion. For example, we need to be able to differentiate levels of cognitive ability or intelligence. We assign scores like 97 IQ points or 115 IQ points so as to allow us to differentiate meaningfully. We'll spend some substantial time on different types of scales later in this lecture. In the meantime, let's move on. The first type of scale is a nominal scale. It allows us to name categories and no effort is undertaken to imply that one category is more of or less of anything than the other category. They're just different categories. In essence, nominal scales allow us to place attributes into two or more mutually exclusive categories. All individuals having common characteristics are assigned to the same category or class, and members in the same category or class are regarded as being equivalent. These categories are mutually exclusive in that individuals cannot belong to one, they must belong to only one category or class. We usually assign numbers to individuals assigned to scale categories. However, numbers really just serve as labels and carry no numerical reasoning. For example, males can be coded as one and females as zero or vice versa. The number assigned to group membership is meaningless and does not imply that men have more or less of anything than women. In fact, we could code group membership as for men as three, and the code for women could be 12,487. It doesn't matter what number we use, they just have to be different. Now, here's some examples of a nominal scale. There is, of course, the, the aforementioned gender, Ethnicity is a naturally occurring, mutually exclusive group membership. You can code managers and non-managers as 0-1. That's a nominal scale used to differentiate those two groups. Nominal scales are the crudest form of measurement, but sometimes it's not only appropriate, it's just the only way to do it. Let's move on.
Now, on the left-hand side, we see a bar graph that artificially dichotomizes trainee success into two groups, unsuccessful and successful. We say they have been artificially dichotomized because if we look at the graph on the right, we see that actually trainee success can be more fine-grained and differentiated than just successful or unsuccessful. Think of it like comparing a score on a class exam. One form of measurement gives either a passing or a failing grade to every student. The other form gives grades like 62.8 or 91.4 or 84.79 or some such. The latter allows us to more accurately measure student success. The moral of this story is that never ever artificially dichotomize a continuous variable. Of course, if the graph on the left was biological sex, there would be no way of graphing sex on a bell curve like on the right. So some variables are truly and completely nominal. Some are artificially forced onto a nominal scale, and that should be avoided whenever possible. Let's move on. Next, we turn to an ordinal scale. An ordinal scale allows us to rank or place in an order various objects, individuals, or variables. This is a step up in sophistication from a nominal scale, where we could not say that one group had more of something than another group. They were just different. Here, individuals are assigned numbers that indicate a relative position as compared to other people. Here, being tall has more height than being short. Here, being smart indicates higher intelligence than being not so smart. Here, coming in first place is better than coming in second place. However, ordinal scales do not allow us to differentiate the magnitude of the difference. How much taller is a tall person than a short person? How much smarter is a smart person than a not so smart person? How much faster did the first place person finish the race than the second place person? These are questions that cannot be answered with an ordinal scale. So here's some examples. Olympic medals are either gold, silver, or bronze. If in a 100 meter race, the first place finisher runs 9.92 and the second place finisher runs 9.93, the first place runner gets a gold medal. The second place finisher gets a silver medal. What if the third place finisher falls down twice? They still get the bronze medal even if they finish in 25.6 seconds or something. Of course, in such a race, there would probably only be three runners, but having only three runners means that the last person still gets a medal. Heck, even, even I could earn an Olympic medal if that was the race. Another example is horse racing. In horse racing, the first place finisher is said to win, the second place horse places, and the third place finisher shows. To win, place, or show indicates no magnitude of difference. That is, the winning horse could finish by a nose, and the placing horse could beat the showing horse by eight furlongs. Let's move on. In this slide, we see a list of fictitious employees. Actually, they aren't fictitious at all, and they're names of management professors who are colleagues of the textbook authors. So only management professors get the joke pardon the feeble attempt at academic humor. However, we see that this company has decided to rank their employees on quality of work completed. They did not get individual scores of their quality, but rather they were simply ranked from best to worst. Here, the worst performer was Lyle Schoenfeld, and the best was W.F. Giles. In this case, the best quality of work gets a number one ranking, the second best is ranked number two, etc. Now we don't know how much better the quality of work was between Giles and Art Bedian, just that Giles' work was better. We don't know how much worse W.H. Holly's work was than Kevin Mossholder's, just that it was worse. Ordinal measurement is simply a ranking. Let's move on. Next, we turn to a third type of measurement scale. An interval scale has the properties of a nominal scale and an ordinal scale, and has equal intervals between the numbers used to represent measurement. 
So not only are people or are the attributes in mutually exclusive categories, like with the nominal scales, and not only are we able to rank order the people or the attribute, but we can also say with certainty that the distance between the scores is the same. That is, the distance between, say, a score of 2 and 4 is the same as the distance between 6 and 8. This is very common on questionnaires where we ask people to indicate how much they agree or disagree with the statement. A score of 1 is the same distance from 2 as a score of 2 is from 3, etc. Sometimes we can even say that there is an absence of something. We might assign a score of zero for a survey response of, of quote, never, unquote, and a score of 10 for a response of, quote, always, unquote. But the zero is not really a true zero. There really is no such thing as a true zero in interval scaling, and the zero is simply set by convention. Interval scales are often used as both predictors and as criterion. It's incredibly difficult to use a nominal or an ordinal scale as a criterion. Now, it's a particularly useful scale for criteria because we can perform much more sophisticated mathematical and statistical operations on intervally measured dependent variables than we can on nominal or ordinal DVs. So, interval DVs are preferred. Here are some examples. IQ is an interval scale in that the difference between a score of 90 and 110 is the same as the difference between scores of 120 and 140. By the way, IQ scores are normed to have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So an average or normal IQ score is exactly 100. So when somebody accuses you of having a double digit IQ, they're insulting you and suggesting that your intelligence is below normal. Anyway, the K through 12 grades in primary and secondary school are interval scales. The difference between first and second grade is the same as the difference between high school juniors and high school seniors. Also, Fahrenheit temperature is an interval scale. Think about each of these for a minute. None have true zeros. Fahrenheit temperature does not. A temperature of zero in Fahrenheit does not mean the complete absence of temperature. One cannot have an IQ of zero because one cannot have zero intelligence unless they are technically brain dead, but we'll leave that to the MDs. One cannot be in grade zero either. Let's move on. On this slide, we see examples of rating scales that use interval measurement. Accuracy of work, quality of work, and attendance all have response scales that range in scores from 1 to 5. The difference between 1 and 2 is assumed to be the same as the difference between 4 and 5. And lastly, there is no true zero. There may be an arbitrary zero, just so we can say that we know what a score of 1 indicates, but if a score of zero was allowed on, say, attendance, then the person being scored would have to never ever show up for work. And if that happened, they wouldn't really even be an employee. Let's move on. The last type of rating scale is a ratio scale, which has all of the properties of nominal, ordinal, and interval scales, plus a true and actual meaningful zero point. Because there is a true zero, we can perform just about any mathematical operation on ratio scales. Ratio scales are called ratio scales because a score of 4 has twice as much of whatever is being measured as a score of 2. A 2 score is a ratio of the score 4. It's one half. It's a ratio. These are very common in the physical sciences, such as body weight, where a person who is 200 pounds is twice as heavy as a person who is 100 pounds. In HR selection, we most often use psychological measurements, so ratio scales are sort of rare. However, there are some examples. Dollars are ratio scales. 
we measure dollar value of sales for salesperson a salesperson who sells one million dollars sells twice as much as someone who sells five hundred thousand the aforementioned weights are ratio scales so the one million is twice as much the five hundred thousand is one half as much and there is a true meaningful zero you can have zero sales we might measure the weight of scrap material on an assembly line as an indicator of mistakes people or head count can be a, a ratio measurement a manager with 20 subordinates measures half as many people as one who has 40 subordinates and you can have zero subordinates it is a legitimate true zero let's move on okay so on this slide we have an overview of all four scales of measurement we can see that each successively sophisticated measurement scale has all of the properties of the less sophisticated scale in review a nominal scale classifies an ordinal scale classifies and ranks an interval scale classifies ranks and has equal distances a ratio scale classifies ranks as equal distances and has a true absolute zero it is vital that we seek to obtain scores that use the highest level of measurement that we can because the more sophisticated the scale of measurement the more sophisticated is the statistics that we can compute. For example, there is no mean for a nominal score. What's the average score for ethnicity at your company? It cannot be computed. It is meaningless. Of course, those two particular variables are naturally occurring nominal variables, and there's nothing we can do about it. Let's move on. Whatever measure or scale you decide to use, it must be standardized for three things. First is content. That is, all persons assessed must be measured by the same information or content. This includes the same format. For example, you wouldn't use a ruler to measure women's height and the length of the tip of our thumb to measure men's height. We wouldn't use the Stanford Binet IQ test for some applicants and our favorite Aunt Bessie's non-copyrighted test of folk sense for hill folk for other applicants. Each applicant must be scored on the same instrument, test, device, or questionnaire. The administration must be standardized. The information must be collected in the same way in all locations and across all administrators each and every time the selection measure is applied. We wouldn't conduct some interviews while running four miles and others in a sauna and others in a classroom. The scoring must be standardized. That is, the rules for scoring must be specified before administering the measure and must be applied the same way with each application. For example, a form must be developed on what is a great interview answer, what is a good interview answer, what is a fair one, what is a poor one, and what is an unacceptable interview answer. Moreover, a system of applying numbers to those answers must be used consistently. Every applicant that gives a great answer must get a score of 10. A good one gets a score of 8, etc. One interviewer cannot give 10s for great answers and another interviewer could, could then not give fives for great answers. Obviously, much, much time must go into standardization procedures and in training employees how to use them. Let's move on. Now, there are some recommended existing selection measures, which I highly recommend rather than developing one's own. Off-the-shelf measures exist for just about everything. Now, sometimes they cost money, but usually that money is money well spent and can keep you out of the courtroom. In the long run, however, existing measures can save you other money too. It's very time-consuming and therefore very expensive to pay people to develop these tests. Let the pros do it for you. There is an entire industry out there that serves this purpose. The advantages of existing measures is that the previously conducted research will report typical score reliability and some validity evidence. For example, 
The Stanford Binet intelligence test typically yields more reliable intelligence scores than the Wunderlich personnel test. Also, there are numerous scientific studies published every year that examine the relationship between test scores on various HR criteria. This relationship is the essence of validity. Validity is about the relationship between scores on some predictor and some criterion. Validity of this type, and there are a bunch of different types, but more on that in another lecture, is often expressed in the form of a correlation coefficient that ranges from negative one to positive one. The further from zero, the stronger the relationship and the stronger the validity. Of course, there are other characteristics of the measure with which we should be concerned as well, and most of that information is in the psychometric report on the test published by the test developer. Such characteristics include the reading level required to correctly complete the test, how much time it typically, typically takes to complete, and how much training the test user or interpreter should have to properly understand the test results. Lastly, most existing measures are superior to any that an HR person could develop. These professionally developed tests are created by highly trained persons with a PhD in either human resources or IO psychology. Again, let the pros do it whenever affordable and feasible. Let's move on. Well, here are some sources for existing measures, most of which are in the public domain or are technically free to use by anyone with enough technical and statistical savvy to do so. So there are annual reference books published by major publishing house, houses. There's the Burroughs Institute that publishes all sorts of information on tests published every year. They review them and synopsize the pertinent information on these tests for you. There are, of course, journals published in which professors and other scientists publish their research, such as JAP, the Journal of Applied Psychology, and Personnel Psychology, known as PSYCH. Then there are professional test publishing houses that develop and sell their tests, like ProEd, Pearson, and the Psychological Corporation. Additionally, there are major professional organizations of which many professors and other scientists are members like the American Psychological Association, the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, the American Educational Research Association, and the now National Council on Measurement in Education, all of which have annual conferences and all of which publish prestigious journals with ample test information in them. Let's move on. Here are the web addresses for some of the sources discussed on the previous slide. I encourage you to take a look at one or two or three of them. Look at the ETS website. Dig up the Burroughs Center for Testing. Take a look at the APA site. You can get lots of information about appropriate, reliable, valid selection tests. Let's move on. So now that you know why you should choose an existing measure, and now that you know where to turn for a measure, let's focus on the actual choice. That is, how do you choose and which one do you choose? First, you have to understand what it is that you're trying to measure. Is it intelligence? Is it job knowledge? Is it personality? If it's personality, do you know the difference between a trait and an attitude? Which traits do you want to measure? Second, you have to choose from a seemingly endless list of measures for the same thing. There are numerous intelligence tests available. There are thousands of tests for one or more personality traits. Third, you have to find out as much information about the test as you can. Read some reviews of it. Read the technical reports of it. Fourth, get a sample copy of the test so you can see it for yourself. Fifth, Become familiar with the expected level of reliability, how fair it is to different groups, what are scores on the test typically related to, how should it be administered, etc. Sixth, decide if there is a compelling argument for using it. 
Remember that all employment tests must be job related. You can't use a test for an employment decision like hiring, promotion, or termination because you think it will provide really cool stuff that you're just dying to know. It must predict job performance. Seventh, you need to determine if there are compelling arguments against using it. Some tests require that you have advanced educational credentials to purchase, administer, and interpret. If you don't have those credentials, be prepared to pay someone who does. Let's move on. Once you've used an existing measure or developed one of your own, you need to understand how to interpret the scores. For example, what does the score 48 on the Wonderlick personnel test indicate or mean? Actually, it means that you might be a genius since the maximum score is 50, but you probably had no way of knowing that until just now. One way to interpret scores is by using norms. That is, a score in a test is compared to what has been determined to be a normal score or range of scores. As previously mentioned, the IQ test is normed so that average scores equal 100. That is, a normal IQ score is 100, and if you score above or below the normal score, we can make inferences about your level of intelligence. However, here are some caveats. The norm group should be relevant for the purpose that's being used. You wouldn't compare scores for high school dropouts on a test of mechanical comprehension to scores on that same test for mechanical engineers. You should also use local norms as opposed to norms based on national data. People are different across the nation. Idiomatic expressions are different. Skills are different. Drawing employees from a relevant job market, usually a local market, is important. Norms are also transitory. That is, they change over time. There's a famous effect in the assessment of cognitive ability called the Flynn effect. The Flynn effect provides evidence that scores on intelligence tests have been steadily increasing over time. People are smarter now than they used to be, and the scores and new norms reflect that. Now, the last caveat regarding the use of norms is that in using normative information, statistical methods are employed to aid interpretation of what a test score indicates. You have to understand statistics to use norms. You must know the difference between a mean and a median, between a standard deviation and score variance, etc. Another way to interpret test scores is by using percentile scores. A percentile score simply shows the percentage of persons in a norm group who fall below a given score on a measure. So the higher the percentile score, the better a person's performance is relative to, other, relative to others in the sample. However, these are not percentage scores. If your percentile score is 89, that simply means that you scored higher than 89% of the other persons in a reference group or a norm group or a sample. It does not mean that you got 89% correct. Many people tend to misuse percentile scores. Like all scores, percentile scores should be interpreted as a range of possible scores. A difference of percentile points may not indicate a real difference in people. The difference may be due to chance, resulting from unreliability of the test. If I score in the 89th percentile and you score in the 91st percentile, your score is not two points better than mine. And in fact, we might actually score the same thing if we took the test again and again and again. Additionally, percentile scores are based on an ordinal scale of measurement not a ratio scale. So again, you cannot subtract the 89th percentile from the 92nd percentile. That's like subtracting a silver medal finish from a gold medal finish. The distance between the finish for the medal winners could be two one hundredths of a second or two minutes. You can also use standard scores, which represent adjustments to raw scores, so that it is possible to determine the proportion of individuals who fall at various standard score levels. Standard scores indicate, in a common measurement unit, how far above or below the mean score that any raw score is. Think about it. It indicates how well or poorly a person performed on a test 
in relation to the average score of all who took the test. Now, there are various types of standard scores. The first and most common is the Z-score, which shows the distance from the normative group mean in standard deviation units. So, let's go back to the IQ test with a norm or mean score of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. That means that if your Z-score in the IQ test is 1.0, then your raw score is 115 because you are 15 points above the mean, which is the standard deviation. If your Z-score is negative 2.0, then your raw score is 70 because you are two standard devi deviations below the mean. That is, you subtract 15 twice from 100 and you get 70. Now, T-scores are another standard score. T-scores are adjusted so that all T-scores are positive. A common way of using T-scores is to set the mean to 50 and the standard deviation to 10. Therefore, if you score 0, you are 5 standard deviations below the mean, which is almost statistically impossible. About two-thirds of T-scores with a mean of 50 will be between 40 and 60 because plus or minus one standard deviation includes about two-thirds of observations in a normal curve. Stanine or stanine scores are another way of using standard scores. And stanines rank order scores from lowest to highest and then divide scores into nine groups. So a low score gets a stanine score of one and a high score gets a staining score of 9. Okay, your eyes are probably glazed over right now and you're thinking, why the heck did I take this class? Well, hang in there. We'll look at this graphically in a few minutes and it should all make much more better sense to you then. Let's move on. All right, on this slide, we'll learn how to compute a Z-score in a little bit more detail than we just went over. Z is equal to the difference between a person's raw score and the mean score of the group divided by the standard deviation. So let's plug and chug for a minute. If the mean on an IQ test is 100 and the standard deviation is 15 and you score 112, what is your Z score? Well, it's X equals 112 minus M equals 100 so X minus M is 12, that's the numerator. You then divide 12 by 15, which is the standard deviation, and you get Z equals 0 0.8. What if the mean on a test is 82, and you score 75, and the standard deviation is 10? You should be able to compute that easy. What's the Z score? Well. That's 75 minus 82, which is negative 7. Then you divide negative 7 by the standard deviation, which is 10. So your z-score is negative 7. Now let's work from a z-score backwards and determine your raw test score. If your z-score in an IQ test is 1.2, and using the same statistics as previously used for IQ tests, where's your r-score? Uh, I'm sorry, your raw score. Let's reconfigure the formula. Now we multiply both sides of the equation by SD, and we have Z times SD equals X minus M. Then we add M to both sides of the new equation, and we get Z times SD plus M equals X. Now let's plug and chug. Let's solve for X. Substituting in Z equals 1.2, standard deviation equals 15, M equals 100, now we compute 1.2 times 15 and then add 100, and our raw score is 18, which is the product of Z and SD. And we add 100 for a raw score, total raw score of 118. Ta-da! Basic seventh grade algebra. Now, for those of you who are not aware, what is a standard deviation? When you see that word standard, think roughly average. A standard deviation is the average distance of every person's score in the sample from the mean. Those who score right at the mean have a zero. Standard deviation is the average distance of all of those in the sample from the mean. 
Okay, let's move on. So here's how, how percentile norms are typically reported in test manuals. What's the average score on this test? Look at the slide. What's the average score on this test? Well, there are two ways of determining this. If we assume a normal distribution where the mean equals the median, which equals the mode, then the mean and the median are the same thing. We see that the z-score of zero is the mean, which indicates that the average score is 35. We could also look at the percentile scores. If 50% scored above a number, then 50% also scored below that number, and that number is the median. And in a normal distribution, the median equals the mean. So we also see here that the average score is 35. All right, that could be fifth grade math. Let's move on. All right, here's what was promised a few slides back. A visual display of the relationship between various standard scores. The lowercase Greek letter sigma indicates the standard deviation. I'm going to use my mouse pointer on the slide. Let's look. Here you see negative one sigma, negative two sigma, negative three sigma, etc. Here we have positive one sigma, positive two sigma, etc. Okay? Now this is called a standard normal curve. There are non-standard normal distributions, but in a standard normal distribution, there are 68.26% of the observations are within plus or minus one standard deviation. Let's look at this, this screen here. 34.13% are between zero, the mean and one standard deviation below. You add 34.13 to 34.13 on the other side of the mean. So the number of people under this curve who score between minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation is equal to 68.26. Now that's slightly more than two thirds of all observations fall under the area of the curve bounded on the left and the right by one sigma unit, or one standard deviation unit. Now, 95.44% of all observations in a standard normal distribution fall within two standard deviation units to the left and right of the mean score. This is how you determine percentile scores. You find where your score is on the horizontal axis and then you figure out what percentage of the other observations are to your left or lower than you. You'll also notice that typical z-scores correspond exactly to the little sigmas. A z-score of negative one is one standard deviation below the mean. The t-scores look a little bit different, but still make use of the standard deviation. So if we arbitrarily set the t-score mean to equal 50 and arbitrarily give sigma a value of 10, then a t-score of 40 is one sigma or one standard deviation below the mean. A t-score of 70 is two standard deviation units above the mean. Here's your t-score axis. The mean is 50. In z-scores, it's zero. The mean is 50. One standard deviation above gives you a t-score of 60. One below gives you a t-score of 40. Two below gives you a t-score of 30. Okay? The staining scores are sort of weird. and They're not used too often. But here, a staining score of 5 puts your score in the very middle, halfway between the low staining of 1 and the high staining of 9. You'll notice that 20% of the scores are in staining 5. Slightly fewer are in stainings four and six, and fewer still in stainings three and seven. This corresponds with the area under the curve. Note also that staining five straddles the mean, such that part of it is to the right of the mean, and the other part is to the left. Remember that the number of observations at any score are on an invisible y-axis, or vertical axis, which is omitted, technically, from this graph. Here are the stainings. Five straddles the mean, which is 
50 in T score, 0 in Z score, 50th percentile. So we have a little bit of the staining to the right, a little bit to the left in the fifth staining. But 20% of the people in the fifth staining are in this area under the curve. That's a lot of people. This is the tallest part of the curve. Most people score in that area. And then all the way down here, we have one staining, and over to the right, we have the ninth staining. And you can see in the ninth staining, if we go up from that cut point, up the graph, now we're looking at just the right-hand tail. Not a lot of people down here underneath that curve. I think you get the hang of it now. If you don't, then you better spend ample time studying this graph and making sure you understand it, because we will build heavily on this as we go on. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.